Uh, next up, we'll have uh, UC Santa Barbara's Erdin Bater, Erdin Ocher, talking to us about the interpretation matters on a case of the, mature, uh, the maturity of the Hulk Mongolian monastic education. Oh, they can't? Well, we're about to have another speaker, and, and uh, it's UC Santa Barbara's Erdenbater Erdenocher. Uh, he's going to speak to us on the interpretation matters on a case of the maturity of the Hulk Mongolian monastic education. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for, um, to the organizers for letting me participate in this conference, and it's a great honor to be here. And thank you so much, Agatha, for the wonderful presentation. It goes well, fits well with my uh, presentation here. Your, your presentation sort of covered the first chapter of my presentation, covering the early days of Gegukpa in Kakka Mongolian region. So uh, my presentation is uh, from uh, research for my foreseeing hope for uh, dissertation. It is well known that different Mongol tribes started, adu started to adopt Tibetan Buddhism in its glib form as early as the 16th century. In subsequent centuries, ethnic Mongolians, many of whom were Hotuktus or incarnate lamas, recognized by Gilu authorities along with their Tibetan preceptor preceptors, had successfully mis successful missionary uh, venture uh, ventures throughout Mongol-speaking regions. As a result, Gilug monasteries were built in Mongol territories, and numerous Tibetan texts, mostly in accordance with the Gilug scholasticism, were composed by Mongol authors. If we survey, survey the 17th century texts from this, these authors that are strictly associated with the so-called Buddhist inner science, Nantor Rigpa, or Buddhist doctrinal studies, the vast majority of these works could be categorized under the genres of Mo Buddhist practice manuals, such as the stages of the path, Lamrim, or Buddhist rituals, including sadhanas and supplication prayers, sondem, or as hagiographies of high lamas, or catalogs of received teachings, Tobik. But very few of those concern controversial issues of Buddhist theology or doctrinal philosophy, and much less directly engaged in Buddhist philosophical polemics. Regardless of its lhasa centered highly political institutional structure, the Gilug Church promulgate itself, promulgates itself to be a unique Buddhist tradition that purely integrates the Buddhist teaching of both Sutta and Tantra. Especially it's believed that the, uh, the tradition is focused on detailed dialectic training in Buddhist philosophy in both oral and written forms has been the foundation of its scholarship. In the 18th century, ethnic Mongol authors, most of whom were associated with Gilug monasteries in Gansu Kokono region, such as Kondu Monast uh, Monastery, started to compose doctrinal exegesis, containing philosophical debates on subtle points of Gilug interpretation of Buddhist doctrines. However, in Kaka Mongolia, it was not until the 19th century, despite the preceding century's establishment of specialized monastic colleges of Buddhist philosophy, the monastic institutions in the classical Gilg form emphasizing philosophical dialectical studies had fully matured. This paper explores one of the first written instances of the mature Gilg scholarship produced in Kafka in the 19th century concerning his teacher's Buddhist hermeneutical positions, Kafka's Ihure abbot, Awan Kedu, was engaged in Buddhist doctrinal polemics. Before we ponder some of the actual polemical points he made, I think it will be more interesting to recollect its sociopolitical context first. Therefore, the first part of my presentation briefly discusses the contextual and historical background of the polemics. Then due to the limited time of the presentation, I will briefly introduce you to Awan Kedu's dialectical style, along with a couple of uh, interesting arguments made by him uh, to help offer the overall impression of the polemical discussion. I will end with some concluding remarks. The first monastic college of Buddhist philosophy in Kaka established in 1754. After only two years, a similar college was founded as a part of Ikure by the second Jitsun Dampa, 
following his founding of monastic colleges for Buddhist Tantra. Systematic training in Buddhist philosophy in Ikure gradually improved by the early 19th century. To expand this training, Ikure's second monastic philosophy college was established by the fourth Jizen Dampa in 1809. Indeed, the 19th century was the golden age for Kaka Mongolian Ikure in producing scholars and exegetes of Buddhist philosophical treatises. The polemical writing of Muan Keduk that I am presenting here marks a vibrant example of Ikure's scholastic efflorescence as a result of its growing maturity regarding Buddhist philosophical scholarship in both Sutra and Tantra. If the text's title is full of polemical insult, the full title of the text is, in English, a further objection to the reply, a roar of guardian elephant of the quarters that dries out the reedy mud reply, which holds the deceitful name, enjoyment ocean of compassion, that swirls into nectar of straightforward speech. It's a very long title. Uh, henceforth, uh, the elephant, the title. From the title, we see that the text is composed of objections of some kind of reply to something else. Metaphorically, Awan Kedu's text is roar of giant, uh, roar of a giant elephant. That elephant dries out, dries out a muddy swamp that has fancy yet false name, Ocean of Compassion. So what is this reply called Ocean of Compassion? And furthermore, what is, it, what is it itself a reply to? The Ocean of Compassion is none other than the title of another polemical work entitled The Enjoyment of Compassion that swirls into the nectar of a straightforward speech, which has risen amidst the clouds of the ordinary one's thoughts. Another long name. Henceforth, The Ocean of Compassion. Written by Belman Konchuk Yantseng, then the retired abbot of Labra in Amdo, the largest Buddhist monastery in the Gansu Kokunu region, where the Manju Qing and Tibetan Gilu enterprises, as well as Mongolian cultural presences, uh, presences and peripherally overlap. The Ocean of Compassion itself is a response to another text entitled A Reply to the Refutation, the Magical Fire, Fire Will, henceforth the Fire. An earlier work also written by our first polemicist, Wang Kedu. In turn, the fire itself is a response to the text, apparently according to itself, refuting Wang Kedu's own teacher, the written Tukus, written Tukus Losan Temba Rabke, Rabke's exegesis entitled A Commentary of the Song on the View, the sound which makes the fortunate lotus blossom, henceforth the sun. Unfortunately, this manuscript, manuscript on the upper left. Unfortunately, the manuscript or a copy of the rebuttal of the written to the commentary has yet to be located. We only, uh, we only able to infer the existence of this text from the subsequent works of ex uh, works exchanged by Belman and Awan Kedu. Belman indicates this text was written by a group of four or five individuals from Labra, also, we know that the missing text was originated from Labrang and that, uh, and that it refutes the written Tukku for his tantric perspective on the explaining the son of the profound view, the recognition of the mother, by Chang'e Robi Dorje, an 18th century Mongol Lama and probably the closest ever Giluk associated to the Qianglong emperor of the Manchu Qin dynasty. So this text, henceforth, is called song, the song. The Chang'e's text is an exceptional work as a Buddhist philosophical literary piece, containing metaphors and cryptic elements, just like its author played a unique role in Chang'e's Gelugpa, and Chang'e's Gelugpa Qing world order. Briefly concerning Belman's uh, Belman Konchuk Yantseng, he is known for his leadership and interest in poli politics during the critical shift of authority over the region, from the Hoshut Mongol princely hierarchy to the state-owning reincarnated lamas backed by the Qing superiority. As it is not uncommon among Tibetan monks, Belman, Belman was highly dedicated, in his, dedicated to his home monastery, Labran. His writings, such as History of India, Tibet, and Mongolia suggests, suggests that 
a ser senior administrator. His writings, such as History of Tibet, uh, India, Tibet, and Mongolia, suggest that as a senior administra administrator of the monastery, his loyalty to Labran seems to have developed into an ambition to make Labran a cosmopolitan, religio political guild center as the crossroads of China, Tibet, and Mongolia. Given Labran's geopolitical context, geopolitical context, his ambition would become a reality due to monasteries increasing fame, especially concerning its religious significances. Accordingly, in order to attract prospective students and potential patrons, especially during an alleged loss of its accustomed Mongol patrons to the local Nyamapas, as described in Belmont's history, developing classic excellence in Labran by relying on the writing, writings of uh, Labran founders, as well as their reincarnations, reincarnations, likely became one, one of the most imperative tasks. Unlike the position of early Gilic proponents under Gilic polemical supremacy, the positions of the 17th and 18th century Gilic scholasticism, whose fundamentals were, of course, traced back to nothing other than the works of Gilic founders, Tsongkhapa and his immediate disciples, had almost no challenges from outside of the Gilic world. Especially for the 18th century Gilgpas, the battles carried out by the preceding Gilgpas generation had successfully defended Tsongkhapa's view with a complete victory. There were only relatively minor intra gilgpas disputes between the different composers of textbooks, Ixchas, concerning the slightly varying presentation of the Gilgpas doctrine. This condition continued until the 19th century, uh, up until the second half, at which point some non gilg scholars from Kham resumed their doctrinal disputes with Gilg classicism as a byproduct of the so called transsectarian Lime movement. In the meantime, at Labrang, monks naturally studied Buddhist philosophy according to the textbook of the first Jami who, uh, uh, who, who was none other than the founder of their, of their monastery. The Jami Shabbat's Ikche, as the newest major Gilgit text book collection, accompanied by com commentaries meticulously written by his well known Amdo disciples, had been esteemed by Labra monks as superior to all other Gilgit Ikchas. In this regard, Konchuk Jigme Wambo, uh, the supposed reincarnation of the omniscient Jami Shabbat, was also believed to have the final authority when it comes to the correct interpretation of Buddhist teachings. In this circumstance, the written Tukku from central Tibet proclaimed in his commentary of the Sun, um, the, the Sun uh, which makes the fortune lotus blossom, hence for the Sun, I have explained it. Uh, written Tukku proclaims that, quote, the second Jamin Shabir Dorje explained the meaning of this very song of the realization from only the sutric point of view. But the actual intentional basis of the song lies in the tantric point of view. So accordingly, here I shall briefly explain the song." Unquote. By the explanation of the song from tantric point of view, the written Tukku refers to the song's another commentary by the second Jamin Sheba, entitled a commentary of the song on the view the lamp of words. Incidentally, these two figures mentioned here, the second Jamin Shabba and the Belma, oh, sorry, the second Jamin Shabba and the Retin Tukku, uh, were direct disciples of Changya, each of whom composed a commentary on his song. It is conceivable that for Labra monks, a more profound interpretation than that of the Jamin Shabba would be simply impossible. Thus, uh, Retin's opinion differing the second Jamin Shabba Dorje as, the way, as to whether the final meaning of the song was a tantric rather than sutric became the impetus of the polemical text originating from Labra. More important with regards to today's presentation are the subsequent works, or works, uh, works by Wan Kedu, since such sophisticated philosophical rebuttals coming from a Kaka scholar objecting disputes from Labran's, Labran polemicists was likely unprecedented at the time and probably the least expected by his Labran counterparts, lest its classic reputation be married and falls short of 
Belmont's original ambition about Labyrinth's growth. Belmont's biography clarifies the incident of this dispute that, quote, when the throne hall the written Vajradhara explained the late Chenge's, Chenge's son of the view, according to the tantric system, several scholars from here, he means Labram, wrote on it. While some refuted him, others responded to that. Consequently, compiling those writings, a refutation text was composed. Then, erroneously thinking that this compiled text had been composed by the Lord Belmont, the logician Churchill Kedup, referring to Amon Kedup, and Harambat Sedan from Kalka and Uchimchung, respectively, wrote separate responses to the refutation. Because it became a great deal, the Lord Belmont composed his reply to the refutation, the enjoyment ocean of compassion and verbal message scattered purifying water of the nectar. Mohan Kedu may also have had his own motivation and ambition to write his response to the Labyrinth refutation in the first place. He had studied with the Retin Tulku and Lhasa and since then venerated him as his root guru for the rest of his life. Thus, to vindicate his teacher's insulted hermeneutical position, Onkhet was engaged in counterattack to the refutation. As for the identity of the Labyrinth's refutation's author, Onkhet's first reply, the fire, gives us two important bits of information. First, the anonymous refutation was written by a disputant who, who has concealed his name in the Dharma data, meaning hidden, concealed it, spreading a series of insulting speeches. Second, Based on the way in which author of this refutation constructed his argument, Awan Kedu agrees that the logic of rebutting words is intellectually sharp, the composition is well crafted, and it also gives an impression of the writer being well learned. In addition, to similar, uh, in addition similar to Bellman's case for Labra, Nguyen Kedu's biography also gives detailed accounts of his tremendous contribution for the development of Ikure of Kalka. Nguyen Kedu served as a Georgia, as the vice abbot, and as the abbot, altogether for 26 years in high position clerical level of Ikure. In fact, during his abbacy, Ikure was reorganized, both the enforcement of discipline and education, educational training for monastics were significantly improved. And many important structures, such as temples and statues, were built. Historical accounts of this period often give credit, credit for this rapid, uh, rapid development of Hikure to the fifth Jizun Tampa, a, young, a, a relatively young fellow who died in his mid-20s. Nonetheless, in his biography, Awan Kedu also seems to have had a vision to grow Jizun Tampa's Ikure into another large Gilig center. Just as the duration of Belmont's abbacy in Labran overlapped the time of the new Jamin Sheba's childhood, Owen Kedu as an Ikure administrator also had to serve the newly recognized Yan Jizun Tamba. Also, the two abbots seem to have had similar ambition to create a new influential Gilig center in the northern part of the Gilgpa Qin world order in the post Qianlong reign. But to, the, um, but to the point whether this new center should be Jamin Shabbat's Labran in Amdo or Jizun Tamba's Ikure in Kaka, the two seem to have had disagreements with one another. As I mentioned above, in response to Wang Kedu's first reply to the refutation, the 70 some year old Belmont, now retired abbot of Labran, bothered to involve himself in the debate over his ocean, either on behalf of his Labran colleagues or to back up his early positions uh, delivered anonymously. I'll say about more in a minute. For the second part of uh, my presentation today, I would like to briefly demonstrate the stylistic tone of Aung Kedu's second textual reply and a couple of interesting examples among the polemical points. 
Along with the Buddha Vajradhara, Chenge Rolbi Dorje, Jemin Jaba, and his kind guru, uh, perhaps the Retin Tuku, Alan Kedu ironically includes his opponent, Belmang, and mediator of the debate, Arya Pandita, the Changun Pandita, um, in the eulogy, eulogy of his elephant, as the recipient, recipient of his praise. However, throughout the text, he doesn't continue to, to extol, extol his op uh, opponent. Instead, he often makes fun of him, sometimes literally laughs at him. Ultimately, he sees the title of Belmont's ocean of compassion as hypocritical because for him, Belmont may have had sarcastically acknowledged Wang Kedu, the respondent of, it, of his critique, to be the object of his compassion. Accordingly, Alan Kedu says, quote, in your own reply, you wrote much that makes yourself an object of compassion. Therefore, there is no one here who would be afraid of you, uh, afraid of your mere words, enjoyment of, uh, enjoyment ocean of compassion. Incidentally, Alan Kedu strongly uh, suspects Belmont to be responsible for writing responsible for writing the original refutation from Labra, instead of the four or five individuals Belma indicated. He only mentioned that he heard directly and directly from reliable sources as his reason for believing so. And he presses Belma on why he decided to follow up on the debate, asking, quote, why did you, Belma, have to convey the argument on behalf of those four or five individuals? How come there was no one in Labran who could write such refutation by himself? Suppose multiple authors actually composed this refutation. Why then did they commission an old man like you, Belma, to write the, uh, write the reply in place of their own? Should they all have died? Would there have been none of their followers who could have written a reply to this response? Wang Kedu continues saying that he was told that Belmont was a good Geshe or Labra, the chief disciple of both the second Jamin Jaba and the famous Kunta Rinpoche, but that he could not sit quite, uh, but that he could not sit quietly with hands joined together because of that fact alone. Then he warns, since evidently speaking, evidently speaking verbal insults has become each of our innate dispositions. Please be patient when I throw harsh words, unquote. The debate covers various issues, such as how a specific term connects to its intended meaning, such that a symbol can indicate its designated object. The labyrinth disputants critique, the labyrinth disputants critique Redin Tulku, the author of the Tantra commentary for his explanation of the utterance, Emma Ho, an exclamation, uh, an exclamation of wonder inserted by the com uh, commentator at the beginning of the root text, the song. When the written Tuku explained Emma Ho with the tantric meaning of e vam, as the in indivisibility of bliss and emptiness, the labyrinth disputants countered that such an application was not appropriate because Emma Ho's can be found not only in Buddhist exoteric teachings, but also even in Tibetan colloquial language. In the fire, on Kedu's first response, may you cleave to the charge with a counter-argument that if that is the case, then the terms like moon, sun, and Raho, the eclipse maker, also cannot have tantric connotations for the same reason. Bellman responds to him with a rather humiliating follow-up, saying, if the Emma-Ho's Emma A syllable should be understood to denote the same meaning of the Evam's E, then one should ascertain that Yama of the Sanskrit name Yamaraja, the Lord of Death, should also denote the Mongolian word Yama for a goat. In return, Awan Kedu responds in his second reply in an elephant with the clarification of his previous argument that he has argued, argued only for the contingent application of the Emahos meaning of the tantric connotation but has never argued for the necessity of it. And he said, isn't it embarrassing that you, uh, quote, isn't it embarrassing that you want to defeat your opponent 
within invalid reasoning, your opponent hasn't ascertained even an indication of what you're charging for. Your careless language saying Yama and Honey, <laughs> Mongolian words for gold and sheep, is evidently a clear sign of you, of you badly wanting to win the debate, unquote. In another instance, Belmont and Ronkid argues on this topic whether Tantrika uh, can perform an activity of physical body such as that which relies on, the con on a, a consort simultaneously single-pointedly focusing on emptiness. Such an activity would be doctrinally problematic for them because until one reaches the Buddhahood, the practitioner cannot simultaneously dwell in both conceptual world and emptiness, the ultimate reality. So in order to not bother you, apparently Bellman's, uh, apparently Bellman's disciple, Konchu Gyatso, uh, and, uh, and an Ikure monk, Mepam Namgyal, here the Mepam Namgyal is not our friend, Ju Mepam, it's a Mongolian lama, monk, continued the debate with the textual exchange. The last reported title of this exchange is said to be a melody of the Garuda raising doubts regarding the lying, lying lines bubble, hence for the Garuda, and is believed to be composed by this Mongolian monk, Nepal Namgyal. So you can see even the title of the text is very, pro, uh, very polemical. For my own remarks on, on the material presented here, I have a few thoughts about one Kedu's debate with Belma. Regardless of its apparent motivations, Wan Kedu's uh, works mark the beginning of a new generation of scholarship produced by Kaka Mongolian Buddhist scholars. Unlike the generation of their predecessors, who mostly consisted of reincarnated Hotuktus, many of whom were from royal families, at least believed to be, the scholars of Wan Kedu's generation in Kaka, uh, generation in Kaka started their own ex extensive scholarship on Buddhist philosophical exegesis, pertaining to subtle doctrinal points and their different interpretations. Moreover, after the pre 19th century Gilgit doctrinal polemics, typically charged against Tsongkhapa's challengers, but before Gilgit disputes with uh, Ju Mepam Gyatso in the turn of the 20th century, there were not many intersectarian polemical threats to the Gilgit doctrine. Of course, intersectarian doctrinal disagreements, mostly based on different interpretations, have continued throughout Gilgit history. Despite the adequate number of intra-sectarian disputes, this particular series of debate exchanges between Awan Kedrup and Bellman is arguably one of the most noteworthy polemical documents of the 19th century Tibeto-Mongolian Buddhism, preserved in written form for both its uh, socio-political framework as well as style and subject matter. The bigger picture of this, a bigger picture of this polemics concerns the theoretical dimension of Buddhist hermeneutics, specifically, is, is there a single true meaning of a Buddhist text? Or does the meaning of the text simply depend on the interpreter's perspective? Regarding these questions, this polemical exchange carried on epistemological tension in Greek scholarship, Greek scholarship standard in its classicism, on the one hand, and its more liberal perspective imposing that the interpretation, interpretation matters on the other hand. Thank you so much. Our, our next speaker is Wei Rong Shen. Uh, he'll speak to us about uh, uh, the Imperial Preceptor uh, Choijol Pakpa Lama as a Tantric Adept in the Mongol Yuan Dynasty. Uh, let's welcome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, first of all, I also like to express my uh, gratitude to the organizers uh, for inviting me to participate in uh, this conference. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to be here. And uh, it's very unfortunate that I'm not able to talk about the Mongolian Buddhism, <laughs> since I'm a Tibetologist, not a Mongolist, 
But I'm going to talk about Tibetan Buddhism uh, practiced by the Mongols uh, during the uh, uh, Mongo, uh, Mongo Yuan period. And uh, also, I would like to say I consider myself a historian and a, a, a philologist. So I always try to study or construct uh, history through uh, textual criticism. So I'm going to introduce a lot of texts written by the imperial preceptor uh, Papa Lama Lutro uh, Jianze, and uh, then uh, uh, try to uh, construct the history how uh, the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism uh, was introduced uh, into uh, Mongolian and among the Mongols during the uh, first first period of a Tibetan Buddhist uh, spread uh, among the Mongols. So my starting point is the uh, uh, Im imperial uh, preceptor Kyrgyz uh, Lama, uh, Papa Lama Lutra Jianzhan, who actually uh, played a big role uh, in spreading the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism among the Mongols. So first of all, I want to give a short uh, introduction to uh, Papa Lutra Jianzhan. I think you all know very well. And he was the uh, first imperial preceptor of the Mongol Yuan dynasty uh, before uh, we uh, know actually uh, this Im, uh, institution of an uh, imperial preceptor was uh, already uh, carried out uh, during the uh, Tengut Xia time. And we uh, often uh, took the Papa Lama as the first imperial preceptor in the entire uh, ancient uh, Chinese history. And, uh, but in the Chinese sources, so the Papa Lama was always uh, uh, depicted as a skillful politician. And he is an ideal type of the statesman, of the Chinese statesman. He often uh, uh, described as a typical uh, Conf Confucian uh, uh, gentleman, so in, in Chinese uh, uh, terms as Junzi, who actually helped the Kublai Khan uh, to establish the Mongol Yuan dynasty and always given very, uh, how to say, wise uh, advices uh, to, the, to the Kublai Khans. And he also created the so-called the, the Papa script, and the, which was used as the, the state uh, script. And he was uh, not only the uh, imperial preceptor, but also the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the chairperson of the so-called Shenzhen Yuan, who is in charge of the uh, Tibet and the whole Buddhist issues uh, in the, the whole, uh, uh, the entire uh, empire. And also, uh, Papa Lama was uh, introduced as a as a Buddhist monk who actually was uh, strict, uh, strictly holds the, the Vinayas. And, uh, and he also, in the Tibetan sources, and he was uh, also uh, described as the, the one uh, who established so-called the Yunche relations with the Kublai Khan, and which uh, was uh, the model of, of late generations of the first Dalai Lama with uh, the, uh, the Ayutthaya Khan, and the fifth Dalai Lama with uh, uh, the Qing emperors, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in the Chinese uh, uh, Telepitaka, in Chinese canons, we found the three texts uh, as attributed to uh, Papa Lama, uh, which were all is a, is a is so-called uh, exoteric Buddhism. The first one is the Shaja Rabse, the clear uh, elucidation of what should be known. That's actually a, a short uh, uh, introduction into the Abhidhamma or, the, or the, to the Buddhist. Cosmology, and the second, actually, in Tibetan, is only uh, the same text is the Vinaya text about uh, what the, the novice or the, the four monk uh, should uh, observe, and those three texts was translated uh, by uh, Shalupa, and uh, who is a, a follower of, of Papa Lama, is a Tengut uh, monk, and those texts included in in the Chinese uh, Tibetakas. So we all thought. Uh, the uh, Papa Lama is a, a monk uh, of uh, hi highly, how to say, the, the, the observing the, ten uh, the, 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 the Vinayas. But indeed, 
and uh, he was a more a tantric mast. Actually, it's a simple uh, a fact is if you look at the list of, of his sumbong, his collected works, actually only the three texts were, 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 were sutras, were, were the, the exoteric. All other texts is, is of tantric nature. So if, uh, those three texts actually is, is written uh, by the, upon the request of uh, uh, the, uh, the Mongol uh, prince and, and the officials. The first one is, uh, is upon the request of the, the crown prince uh, Zheng Jing, and uh, you, you know very well. And, uh, and uh, then why I uh, come this idea and uh, to uh, 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 emphasize actually the uh, Papa Lama actually was a, a tantric mast. And the reason is I recently I discovered uh, a lot of texts and uh, uh, attributed to uh, Papa Lama, and, uh, which were uh, translated into uh, either Chinese or into Tangut uh, during the uh, Mongol Yuan uh, time, or at uh, the, the, uh, the uh, early period of, of the Ming. And those texts, of course, are all of a tantric nature. So I made a list. Is a, is a 12 text. Some is, a, is short, and some is, is a, a very long. So I uh, go uh, through is a, a briefly. The first one is the is Lama Nejo, the Guru Yuga, which was uh, where I found, I, I, I tell you later, <laughs> and uh, this actually is, is still used uh, by the, the Chinese practitioners of uh, Tibetan Tantric Buddhism nowadays. And the second one is uh, uh, Rabdu Nepa, uh, Chale Dutu was a, as a consecrations text. As actually, uh, maybe was this text was used by the uh, consecration of the, the white stupas now in Beijing, which was, was built during the, uh, the Yuan time. The third one is a Jambe Trupta, is a Sadhana text of the, the deity yoga of, of uh, Maitreya. Uh, the fourth one, as I couldn't identify the the Tibetan original, so according to the Chinese translation, it should be the Wang Chu Song Wei Chuka, but uh, I couldn't uh, find uh, the, the Tibetan origin of this text. And the, the fifth one is uh, actually the, uh, a Sadhana text of the, the mandras of uh, uh, Shri He, he Vajra. And the, the, the sixth one is the same. And it is a very long text. Is what's what's made made this text uh, extraordinary? Is this text was translated by the last Song Emperor, who actually was was, was uh, taken by the uh, Kublai Khan uh, uh, from Hangzhou uh, and into Beijing into Dadu, and then uh, sent him in exile. In he studied. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the Sakya you know, for, for many, many years. On the later period uh, of the year, he was executed because the Mongol Khan still have the, the fear that he uh, maybe came in back into the power and to repress the Mongols, was, was executed. But uh, this text is recently discovered in, in Dali, in, in Yunnan province, uh, 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 according to the, the colophon that was, was translated by by the last of emperors. And, the, and the, the seventh one is the second part of the uh, detailed commentary on the He Vajra Tantra, and written by uh, Papa Lama, and uh, maybe the translated at the beginning of the, the Song Dynasty. So we, so far, we didn't uh, have the, the full uh, the Chinese translation of the He Vajra Tantra, but that's the, the, the first one. As a complete one, the, uh, although only the second part, the first part we didn't find. And the, the eighth and the ninth is a short text, the sadhana text, uh, on, the, on the, the deity uh, meditation uh, of the Avalokiteshvaras. And the, the tenth one is a, is a, a, actual, a compilation of uh, sadhanas. Uh, related to Hevajala Tantra, uh, which is, is a very long text, and uh, we, uh, the original, no, the translation is, is uh, uh, considered as, as uh, the, the best treasure uh, in the Taiwan, the Taipei, the, the Palace Museum. And the fifth one is a Sadhana text of uh, Ushnisha Vijaya, is also uh, in, in Taiwan, and uh, 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 translated at the beginning of the meantime. 
under the 12s is actually is a, uh, uh, just recently uh, discovered is uh, uh, also a sadhana text of the Heva Jala Tantra, which was translated into Tangut and during the Mongol Yuan time. You, you, people thought that after the, the Mongols conquered the, the, the Tangut kingdom in 1227, actually the, the Tangut uh, used to uh, stop to, to, to use, but now we found this text, and this original text is written by Papa Lama uh, around 1258. So we still found the Tangut translation. You know? And uh, it may be, uh, it, 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 the, 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 it testified the Tangut script we used, uh, I think, during the entire the Mongol Yuan time, maybe also the, at the beginning of, of the Ming time, still usable. And the, where I did I found those texts? Actually, uh, so called the, the Mongol Yuan history uh, is, is, is a, a very advanced the academic field. There's a lot of people are doing a lot of studies on, on the Mongol Yuan time. Why are those texts left uh, undiscovered? I think uh, because those texts are, uh, are totally of a religious nature. If you are not familiar with, with Tibetan Buddhism, you are not able to understand them. So make no sense to those uh, Mongol Yuan historians. So it's, it's very uh, fortunate for me. So I studied uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, when I discovered those texts, uh, it's, for me, it is uh, such a, a surprise and uh, exciting uh, event to, to get able to read those texts and then to figure out uh, what those texts are all about. But uh, actually it took a long time, actually. Okay. Some texts that I discovered uh, uh, 20 years ago, I couldn't understand. But uh, then later I found more and more, and recently, you know, in China, everywhere is a construction site. All, all, all of a sudden uh, came out a lot of new texts. So it's uh, a, a golden time for, for, for like a Chinese, uh, Tibetan, uh, Buddhist historian to be able to, to use those sources. The first one, I think, the uh, uh, first uh, 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 a group of, of, of text, uh, both in Chinese and in Tangut, so I, I discovered among the so-called Kalakoto uh, collections, uh, which uh, is mostly of, of Tangut origin, and some is of Yuan time, and some is even, even, even later. But those texts was, was uh, preserved in, mostly in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, we couldn't get access to them until to the end of last century. And uh, this text became uh, available to us through uh, 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 facsimile uh, the prints uh, in Shanghai. Then among those texts, actually, I uh, discovered a, a, a large number of texts uh, uh, which were uh, of the Tibetan Buddhism, which were uh, translated into Chinese uh, during the Mongol Yuan uh, and, the, and the early Ming time, but mostly the Mongol Yuan time. And, uh, and some, and of course, there are more uh, Tangut texts. They are all, all about the, the Tibetan Buddhism. But uh, uh, I, I'm working on those texts with uh, colleagues, but uh, uh, not for, for fully fully done. But uh, among the Chinese texts, we we found uh, three kinds of texts. Is, is, uh, more important, but before we didn't know that actually the Tibetan Tantra Buddhists were already translated into, into Chinese. We often thought that uh, started uh, actually very late. But uh, uh, the first text I, I discovered is about the Dream Yoga, about, about the Badu. The, the, we saw the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead so kind of was, was uh, only introduced into China in the, uh, at the middle of the 1990s with the Sukhya Rinpoche's book it was uh, translated into Chinese, published in Taiwan, and uh, smuggled in, into mainland China. But actually, 700 years ago, we already know that very well. And there's an, is a, a, a serious text of, about the Naro Chuchu, the, the six doctrines of, of, of Narupa. And the other text uh, uh, is of the, about the Rang, uh, Landry, is a Sakyapa text, and was so-called the, the path with its result. And then a lot of the, the deity yugas, like the, the, among a lot of people, a lot of text is about the Mahakala code, and, and then uh, 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 about the, uh, 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 the deity yugas, including the Maitriya and the Avalokiteshvara and, and others. So through the, the, 
uh, a pre primary uh, uh, investigation of those texts, uh, we uh, uh, can quite assure that actually the, the Mongol adoption of a Tibetan Tantric Buddhism uh, benefited from the predominance of Tibetan Buddhism in the Tanguda Kingdom, which actually uh, 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 earlier to Sperling, I think in the 80s, he wrote a short article and already talked about that. But at that time, he didn't have any, any sources. And then I also figured out that the Uyghur played a significant role in disseminating Tibetan Tantric Buddhism among the Tanguts, Mongols, and they were a Tibetan Buddhist for, for centuries as well. Uh, you, because uh, I uh, compared those texts with so-called the, the Tufan Uyghurlik. So if we, we, we read the, uh, uh, the, the, all those translations made by uh, uh, Peter Timmer and uh, George Kala in the, in the 70s and the 80s, and I found out that those texts are all, all similar to, uh, they translated from Uyghur in, 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 into, into German. <laughs> and those texts are actually uh, uh, all similar to those Chinese texts uh, we, we discovered uh, among the, the Kalakutus. I think it's one book, uh, they're called the Uyghurish uh, Tutenbuch. Uh, and the Uyghur Book of the Dead, actually, all the texts with the Chinese versions are all among those, those texts. And, uh, and the second, uh, uh, the large scope of, of the text is included in so-called the secret collection of, of works on the essential path of Mahayana. And this text also, uh, Chris Beckwith uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, mentioned in, in his, one of his uh, essays published those in the 80s. So you all including like 80 some 80 plus texts. The most text is also Lanzhi, the Sakyapa text. And the, uh, besides the Sakyapa text, there are 23 Mahamudra texts of unknown origin. And this, uh, the, the, the Chinese version included in, the, in this book, uh, the, 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 the Tankuta version is among the, uh, the Kalakutu or collections. And uh, in this book, this, actually this book is, is, is said to be uh, leaked from the uh, Qianlong's uh, court. Uh, the summer palace in, in, in Chengde, in Rehe. So this, uh, the, until the Qianlong emperor still practicing uh, this tantric Buddhism according to those texts. And this text actually, according to my study, is, is a collection of the essential works of Tibetan tantric Buddhism translated uh, f starting from the Tangut time and through the Yuan and the early Ming period. And there are four uh, texts actually is, is, a, is a translation of a Papa Lama's, uh, uh, Papa, the imperial precept of Papa's text, and the five was a, uh, some uh, the uh, Saka Bandidas, uh, and uh, also others with the, the third uh, Saka master, Trapa uh, Jenzans, quite very long. And then the other two texts we, we, uh, I mentioned is one is the so-called the spring well of nectar of the Hevajala Sadhana, is a very long text now is in Taiwan, and the other one is the Vishnisha Vijaya Sadhana, also, also in Taiwan. And in this text, I uh, saw uh, the two lists of the gurus of the transmission lineage of the text. And according to this, this list, I can uh, figure out actually uh, this text uh, also attributed to uh, Papa Lama, which was translated. Uh, uh, at the, the early period of the Ming time, and after the Papa Lama, there are still uh, five uh, names five, on, on this list. So Papa Lama died in uh, 12, uh, 12 80, uh, 85. After five generations, it's not no more Yuan time. And on the, on the, the last uh, names in the, in the list is, is Sahajashri. Another one is called uh, Jena uh, Rashmi. The all the famous uh, masters in the early period of Ming. The, the Sahajashan is from Indian, and the, uh, the Jena Rashmi actually is a, is a Chinese, uh, Zhiguang uh, Lama. And uh, so it's, the time is limited, I could have to go, go through. And then uh, all those texts, so I uh, studied all those texts, and I tried to identify uh, the uh, the Tibetan origin of, of those texts also is it is quite successfully actually I could uh, uh, identify the most text uh, uh, the, of the, the Tibetan originals 
but only some, if those texts were translated in, during the Tangut Kingdom, it's rather difficult to identify the Tibetan originals. Uh, and uh, maybe th those texts, uh, I think is, is, some is written, for example, by Gyulo uh, Zawa uh, Kupalatse. Uh, for example, he, he translated also the Sambuddha Tantra, but it was later was excluded uh, from the Tib uh, Tibetan uh, Ganju uh, by uh, Buddha Rinpoche. But his, this kind of text also was transmitted uh, so into Tangut Kingdom and they used uh, as the original uh, to, uh, uh, to be translated into Tangut and the Chinese, uh, but this Tibetan original not last. So we're still uh, doing, uh, um, make a lot of effort, uh, try to identify the, all, all the Tibetan originals of those texts, but still difficult. But then know uh, what about the history? Why is the uh, Papa Lama, uh, uh, I, why, why I, I uh, could claim Papa Lama played a big role in, in transmitting the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism among the Mongols. Then we look back the, about the, the uh, Tibetan, uh, the history of the Tibetan uh, uh, Buddhism uh, in China or the, in, in Central Asia. So we, we start with the traditional uh, image, uh, the Chinese image of the Tibetan Lamas and the Tibetan Buddhism. So uh, things, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite long, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is uh, almost uh, considered as equal to tantric sex, and the Tibetan Buddhism is, is, is the magic, uh, the sorcery, and the Tibetan lamas are evils and, and the root and the, and the ten, uh, uh, tyrannical, and the Tibetan Buddhism that's, that's the, the, is equal to uh, lamaism and, and the go, uh, ghostly religion. So I think yesterday uh, Johan mentioned that Lamaism uh, is, a, is, is an, a not bad term at all. But I, I, I would say at the beginning, uh, the, the, the etymologically, the Lama Jiao in Chinese is also quite, uh, quite positive. The first, first time it appears uh, during the Ming, Ming period is a, a, actually in the uh, is a, a stele uh, inscription uh, written by the, the Ming uh, Prime Minister Zhang Juzhen, and he said that because the, the, the Lama Jiao is just a, a, a section uh, of the uh, Buddhism is just different from the Chinese Chan Buddhism, but it's nothing, nothing bad. But in the late, of course, the, the, the Lama Jiao uh, uh, carries a lot of negative uh, connotations. Is equal to ghost religion. So why? Then I think there are many stories uh, in the uh, uh, Chinese sources in the in the late Yuan period and the early uh, Ming period. Uh, they talk about the Tibetan Buddhism, uh, which uh, which were actually practiced by the uh, uh, Mongol or Khans at the, at the court. There are three three things. The first one is so-called the secret teaching of a supreme bliss. It's equal to uh, the practice in pair or, or, or even uh, group sex at the, the imperial court of, of a great Mongol Khans. The second one is, is, is uh, famous. It's called the dance of 16, hev uh, 16 uh, heavenly devils. Uh, as you see, 16 uh, heavenly devils or, or female is equal to Mongol Khan's uh, erotic game with 16 uh, dancing consorts. Actually, uh, since then, actually, uh, there are always people who make effort to reconstruct this kind of dance. I think last year I have heard in the Mongolia a, a, a group of people uh, the rehearses this dance and it was a band. So the, the, those girls wear to to uh, to less clothes is is is, is not, not allowed. And the third one is called the practice of uh, the yendir, uh, the the magic show of, of the body or, or, or tantric sex. But uh, uh, I think those stories are mostly made up. I think that all our fictional uh, uh, depictions by outsiders filled with cultural bias, uh, political hatred, and religious ignorance, and language barriers. But only things we can believe, the things we couldn't understand. For example, what is the secret teaching of a supreme bliss? Uh, what, is, what is the dance of a 16 heavenly devils? Because they, they cannot make made it up. They didn't know an, uh, the origin. And the third one, what is India? As it took a long, long time, I think uh, uh, several hundred years, you couldn't understand. Uh, that's, that's why I think uh, it became a, a, 
uh, are the typical the Chinese narratives of the history of the end of, of the Yuan Dynasty. So Tibetan lamas were often condemned as uh, uh, scapegoats of the rapid destruction of the Yuan em Empire in both Chinese historical and literary traditions. And the Tibetan lamas as evil monks were always uh, as an evil monk were demonized, uh, shamanized, and sexualized. And the Tibetan Buddhism is equal to the, to the art of the, the bedchamber and the art of, of love. So the, the story of the Tibetan lamas at the Mongol court is providing, uh, provided uh, entirely new and colorful and exotic sources uh, for, to the creature of always corrupted the last emperors in Chinese historiography. So the, there's a saying says, with one change, the, the Middle Kingdom became barbarians. Since uh, the Mongols conquered China, so the Middle Kingdom be became barbarians. With another change, the barbarians uh, became birds and beasts. Because another change is uh, the, the, the Tibetan lamas conquered the Mongols use uh, their the tantric uh, practices. And then the, 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 uh, in Chinese tradition, there are a lot of sources to, to uh, uh, how to say, exaggerate all those, those practices. For example, there is a a famous the erotic novel is written by a famous uh, the Ming literati called the, uh, the Ocean of uh, uh, Iniquities of Monks and Nuns, and they talk about the stories of how the monks and nuns uh, uh, conduct uh, this kind of uh, por pornographic uh, uh, stories. And the, the one chapter of this is called uh, the, the Monks from the, the West. The, the, actually, they, they made up these this three practices. Uh, but the description about the, the Tibetan tantric Buddhism, uh, tantric uh, the practices, is, is a word for word a copy of the so called the nine uh, positions of the handbook of sex of the plain girls. That was a Chinese classic of the art of, of the bed chambers. They have nothing to do, of course, with, 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 uh, with, 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 with Chinese Buddhism. Then, uh, through this, uh, our, our study of, of this text I uh, early uh, listed, uh, but there's, actually there are more texts. It's not uh, only written by, by Papa Lama. I actually discovered the whole uh, uh, set uh, of the, the Chinese translation of, of the, the Lantzhi. Uh, I think the all, all text I think, of, of the, the, the past with its result text was translated into, into Chinese during the, the Yuan period. And there is a, is a, a so -called whole collection called, called so-called Vilupa uh, uh, doctrines, this or, or, or Sakyapa origins. Then I, I actually uh, uh, figured out, so what is the dance of 16 heavenly devils uh, uh, which was often mistaken uh, as a, a sexualized ritual by the Chinese literature. Actually, the, it is the so-called the, 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 uh, the, the dance of 16 heavenly devils is the imagined the offering performance uh, to the mandala of the Shri Sumbong. We uh, found a, a text, actually, he, he wrote uh, upon the request of Kublai Khan and uh, uh, is called Rimachuchugi Chube Tsikchani, actually two, two pieces of, of, of this uh, ritual performance of, of the 16 dancing, uh, dancing girls. And uh, it, it means uh, at least uh, uh, the Papa Lama already introduced this, this practice uh, into uh, uh, the, 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 the Mongol Court actually the, at that time the Kublai Khan wasn't uh, the, the great Khan and he was a prince at Kaiping so in, in the, in the uh, Yuan Shangdu was was not in Beijing that's a very very earlier so in the 1250s already translated into that's, that has nothing to do with uh, with the destruction of the Great Mongol Empire <laughs> in, the, in the end, end of, the, of the year. And he is uh, the first one. I, I think also uh, later I found that another uh, text is written by Buddha Rinchinchu. But this is the first one uh, uh, about so uh, the the so-called also sadhana or the ritual text of the 16 uh, rima, and and the second one actually is now if you read the Chinese uh, uh, novels, they often uh, came uh, came across this, this word yan uh, Nobody knows what what is the 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 the, the, the 
actually according to, to the Chinese sources, the success is, is, a, is a magic show of the body or the, uh, the, the movement of the qi, so inside, the, inside your body. But later, they uh, often uh, took as the same as the so-called secret teaching of the, the supreme bliss. But uh, the yindia, yindia, uh, is not a Chinese word, or not a word of Chinese origin. The people tried very hard to, to, uh, uh, how to say, the figure out the, the original uh, word or their term is a Sanskrit, is a Mongol, is a Tibetan. is is, is very difficult. As this text actually was. Uh, uh, made uh, available through the translation of, a, of a, a, a Robert Van Golik in his book, the, the how to say the the sexual uh, uh, the, the sexual life in, in ancient China or some he, he one has a book. And then Rolf Stein and Herbert Frank wrote a, a commentary, a review on those book, and they both tried hard uh, to solve this problem philologically. But uh, I think they were not able to because they didn't know actually this word uh, is, is uh, the original word is, is Sanskrit or the Tibetan or the Mongols. Or they didn't even mis uh, misled by the Chinese uh, uh, description said that the, the India is equal to supreme bliss, but actually has nothing to do with supreme bliss. That's why the, the, the uh, uh, Rolf Stein said the, the yen is a performance, and the deer is a jira, uh, is, is means happiness. But the, the Herbert Frank said the yen deer is just an uh, adder, that's all, all, all wrong, actually. Uh, according to my study, uh, actually, the, uh, also we, we, through the, the text, uh, we found out actually the so called the, the practice of a yen deer is, is uh, in Tibetan called kind of chukku, it, is uh, the magic. Uh, wheels it is is not different than uh, what the uh, today the Nankando Bu uh, uh, taught uh, widely extensively in Italy uh, to his <laughs> and so the, the Tibetan guru, guru Tibetan uh, the, 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 the master Nankando Bu so still performs and uh, we found the text uh, is one called the Lanzhou Chukko that that's already practiced uh, during the Tangu Tsha time. And then the many texts are actually attributed to, to Papa Lama that mentioned that actually is, is also related, is a practice related to the uh, so-called Tomome, the inner heat, and all, all those texts. So I found, found many texts. Is, is one of the texts maybe of Tangut origin is a, is a collection of the, uh, the, 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 the sadhanas, of the, the Sakyapa teaching, uh, the, the path with, with it, it, its, its result. So the so Yendir actually is a way good term of a Yantra, is my guess. So it's, it's, it's a Yendir. It's, a, it's not a charge. So Yantra, Yuga, uh, the, is a Choko. That's a, and uh, and uh, so also uh, 10 years ago, uh, a text is also from Chenlong's court became available. Is a, uh, 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 illustrative uh, the text of uh, actually Japa Jenzan's Nejogi Chile Songju Zanigi Choko. Actually, that's exactly the, the, the Yendia, the Yantra Yuga. Actually, they're all together uh, 108 pictures and shows different kinds of uh, the body movement and the in, in purpose of, of cure some specific disease. Actually, that text is, a, is a, the, the basic text is actually the the, 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 the third uh, Sakyapa Lama's text is, is called the, the actually uh, the 32 uh, movement of this uh, magic uh, uh, wheels. And this, uh, this 32 movement should uh, do uh, three times. One is according to the, to the, uh, the order, and, uh, and the second one is uh, counter the order, and, uh, and the third one is mixed. So do this, te this text, I think, uh, uh, should be translated either in the end of Yuan or the, or the, origin, uh, the, the beginning of the Ming, but this painted uh, uh, in the Qing time. So the Qianlong was practicing. Uh, the, the, this this uh, yender the, the yantra yoga, I think. The, 
And the, the third one, I think, is so called the, the secret teaching of the supreme bliss. So if you read the, the Sakyapa text, the Lanzo text, it became uh, quite uh, uh, clear that actually is is a, is a, a refer to the the Du Cha Chimbu Jiwa or Jesu Chapa Nenjo or or the the Dewa Chimbu Nimba Shuba. That's actually the uh, so called the, the yoga of a supreme place and uh, often uh, practiced uh, by the the Sakyapa Lamas also very much uh, related uh, to the path with its result on the He Vajra. Actually, He Vajra uh, uh, often uh, explained as the uh, supreme bliss, uh, the, the, the literal meanings. So all the, those uh, three uh, doctrines, actually uh, the three practices, uh, I would say, is, uh, uh, were introduced uh, either directly uh, by Papa Lama or by other uh, Sakyapa Lamas. And, uh, and uh, most of them has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with uh, tantric. Uh, sex is a, the only the the, the 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 third one, the so-called secret teaching of a, a supreme bliss, involves the the, the tantric uh, union of man and 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 and, 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 and woman. So in a short, so in, in the, the conclusion, I think uh, 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 we will now uh, uh, with comfort to say actually Papa Lama wasn't uh, uh, really a. Uh, a Chinese styled uh, state man, but he is rather an accomplished uh, tantric adept uh, who played an essential role in the dissemination of a Tibetan tantric Buddhism among the Mongols and the Tanguts and even, even Uyghurs. Uh, among his disciples, there are a lot of uh, Uyghur and, 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 and Tanguts people who actually translated many texts. Uh, uh, some is already discovered, some is still still unknown, and uh, also also uh, Chinese. And uh, I think the the uh, Tibetan Buddhism, the practice of Tibetan Buddhism, when was not stopped uh, by the replacement uh, uh, by by the Chinese Ming Dynasty, and uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, uh, Ming time, uh, the Tibetan Buddhism was more popular, uh, even then. It, it was during the Yuan time and the, in the Yongle period, at least in the Beijing, there are more than 2,000 lamas uh, the who stationed in, in Beijing. That's why I said that if the, the, the Chinese emperor's belief in Tibetan Buddhism could be uh, considered as, as so called in the Asian character, then I think the, the Yongle, the, the Ming, is also in the Asia. Empire is not only the, the, the Qianlong's Qing dynasty. Uh, so is uh, the popularity of Tibetan tantric Buddhism and in and outside the Mongol court of the, of the Yuan left a, a long-lasting uh, legacy in its uh, following dynasties. I think if we talk about the Mongolian Buddhism or the talk about the Mongols' adoption of Tibetan Buddhism or the Mongols' conversion to Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I think we really should start earlier, not not starting from the time. Uh, of the third Dalai Lama's uh, uh, establishment, uh, the relationship, so-called the Yunche relationship between third Dalai Lama and, 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 and the uh, Altai Khans. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, the, the biased Chinese uh, uh, literature on Tibetan Tantric Buddhism needs to be reconsidered. Thank you very much.